Hello, welcome to another episode of the Capital Employed Podcast. For this episode, we had the pleasure of being joined by David Ridland, the manager and CIO of Castle Bay Investment Partners. In this episode, David talks us through his investment philosophy, process and his thesis for investing in two UK companies that he's bullish on for the long term. Before we begin, we have recently launched the Capital Employed Letter. We will be doing two write-ups per month about stocks that have piqued our interest. Now these will mostly be quality growing small caps from around the world, so if that's your cup of tea, visit capitalemployed.substack.com and add your email to the list. That's capitalemployed.substack.com. Okay, let's jump into this week's episode. Please enjoy my conversation with David. Hi, David. Thanks for coming on to the podcast. Can you provide an overview of Castle Bay Investment Partners and what is your investment philosophy and your investment style? Yes, of course. And thanks, John, for having me on. So Castle Bay, we started Castle Bay back in 2013 and we as David McNeil and I, we've got two other uh, partners as well, non-working partners, Alistair and John, and they've they've been fantastic as we've uh, moved along our, our investment journey. But in essence, there's sort of two parts to, to the business. We founded it with relationships of, of private clients, and the idea was to bring them across, and they're mainly clients that David had developed relationships with over the years. And you know, the idea was to bring those across, found Castle Bay Investment Partners, and then sort of 15, 20 months later on, launch a, a UK equity fund. And that's what we did at the beginning of 2015. And in essence, what we're trying to do in terms of our investment philosophy is we're trying to buy high quality businesses, not pay too much for that privilege of owning these high quality businesses, and crucially, own them for for the longer term. You know, it's interesting when we look at the quality of or high quality investors over several decades, names like Peter Lynch, Anthony Bolton, Warren Buffett, etc., and maybe Terry Smith more recently, there's a kind of common link between them all. They all, all invest in slightly different ways, but the most common link is the uh, average holding period. You know, Peter Lynch talks in his, in his uh, famous book, One Up on Wall Street, he had these 10 baggers, so 10x companies, so they're businesses whose share price had, had gone up more than tenfold since, since he bought them. But the really interesting point from our perspective is, well, when did that manifest itself? It wasn't in years one, two, and three. It was on average about years seven and eight. So when you buy a business, you've got to be happy to own that business. And, and we find the best way of doing that is, as I say, to, to buy high quality businesses and then own them for, for the long term. And more specifically, what type of businesses do you like to invest in? Are there any characteristics, uh, key metrics you're looking for? Yes. Yeah, so what we do, and this is really interesting, it's kind of born from the many investing mistakes I've made over the, over the years. When I first started, and I started my investment career at Ignis uh, in, in Glasgow um, back in the mid, mid to late 90s. And I created an investment database. And from that database, one of the aspects was looking at the valuations. And you would screen um, companies in relation to their own history. And then obviously, you could rank them across the UK market, you know, the cheapest and, and, and the most expensive. And then what that I had to do is decide, well, OK, of the top 20 or 30 businesses that are looking very attractively valued, which ones of those are high enough quality uh, that we'd be happy to invest in for the long term? And of course, eventually, the penny dropped that to use uh, Charlie Munger's principle of inversion, if we, if we swap that around and say, well, let's define what quality is, and then we can you know, work out whether we're being asked to pay a fair, fair price and value for them. So that's what, what we did. And that created an investment universe. And within that, we were focusing on some quantitative measures. And we do a, a yearly screening. In fact, we're just coming up to, to refresh the, the annual screening. And it, it looks at um, aspects like return on an equity, return on capital employed, return on tangible assets. Those are three of, of the, the measures that we use. And then we can basically test businesses. So when we define quality, we want ideally these businesses to be earning returns on equity in excess of 20% and not just in the last year, but you know consistently over time. And there's a specific reason for that. And that's because most companies will pay out obviously in the forms of, of, of dividends, et cetera, and um, cash flows to, to shareholders. And that's fine. That can provide part of your return. But the, cre- the key aspect is 
or what, what's the capital that the business retains and then makes a future return? And this is the, the critical point. I mentioned Charlie Munger. He has a, a sort of famous quote that, we've, that we often use, and that's the share price of a business reflects the underlying returns that that business is making. So if you've got a business that's, that's making a 20% return on equity, and let's say it is quite young and it sees lots of growth, it doesn't pay out any money to shareholders just now because, as I say, it's quite young. So if it can reinvest at that rate, that's the rate at which your shareholder equity is, is going to grow. And that's the piece of the pie as investors in which we're most interested. And his simple point is that over the medium and long term, the share price will follow that. Now, of course, in the short term, the market falls in and out of love with businesses. We all know, you know humans in general love, love a good story. So as the stories come and ebb and flow, you, the businesses become expensive and, and maybe cheaper if, if they're derated and they fall out of favor. And all we're trying to do, in, in part coming back to our sort of key, key principles, is identify these businesses, put them into an investment universe, get to understand them over not just a, a year, but over a period of years, compound that knowledge, if you like, uh, and then work out whether we're paying a fair price. And the, the first quarter last year was actually the first time that we became fully invested in the fund during, during its lifetime. And um, just because with COVID, obviously, and the fallout in the markets, it gave us a fantastic opportunity to come in and support some really high quality businesses that had been expensive, but had been sold off and uh, you know, became much more attractive from a valuation perspective. I noticed you mentioned you like to invest in businesses with um, return of equities over 20%. There's a company we're going to uh, talk about a little later called Avon Protection, whose sort of mm-hmm. return on equity has been going down. I notice it's still in your portfolio. Yes. Um, what causes you to sell a stock? Would that big falling return of equity be one of those reasons? And then would I, are there any other reasons as well? Yeah, that's a really good question, Rob, because I think it's important to note that we're not, not a quant fund. So we're not just buying and selling businesses because uh, you know, they, the, the returns may pass a certain element. What, what's crucial is understanding how these businesses you know, are producing those returns and critically, because we, we create a model, as you probably expect, uh, on each of our businesses going back se- you know, several years, over a decade uh, in most instances. And what we're looking at is trying to understand the changing shape uh, of the business over time. So you know, Avon Rubber historically has made very uh, strong uh, returns, you know, well in excess of that 20%. And it's made a couple of, um, a couple of acquisitions, actually, which we think are going to enhance the, the business. It used to be Avon Rubber, and now, and now it's called Avon Protection because it's sold off. The, the milk business, Milk Right and Interpulse, which is a sort of seven, seven and a half percent margin business and reinvested in the protection. So this is you know, chemical, biological, radi- radiological and, and nuclear protect- protective equipment, effectively respirators. Um, you know, the M50 being the most well known of, of its uh, respirators. And it's reinvesting in, in this business, and it's, which is much higher margin. And together, they've made an acquisition of uh, Team Wendy recently, which is a helmet uh, maker, and this is for military, but also for first responding markets. You know, for for uh, you know the, the Department of Defense in the states and the and the, the MOD in, in the UK, as well as NATO, are, are three of their customers. And over time, they developed these long term contracts. So when you're asking about returns and and where they might decline, the critical part is that we want to still see a positive spread where the returns are higher than the cost of investing. Now, you may well ask, well, what, what's, what's the cost of investing? Well, as investors, obviously, we get to choose what that is. And we've set the bar quite high, we think conservative, at 10%. So the reason why you know, I was talking about that as a minimum for businesses at, at 20% when we're doing our annual screening is to say, well, in the UK market, which is a mature market, the, you know, roughly speaking, you know, there's, there's a 50% payout ratio and therefore a 50% retention ratio. So if you think about that 20% business retaining half of its, its profits and reinvesting those in the business, you can see that the compounding element takes us near towards our, our cost of investing at 10%. Clearly, we want that to be a positive spread because if it isn't, any growth that the business undertakes is actually going to destroy value rather than create it. And it's going to one sure, sure uh, law in, in um, investing, and that is capital flows away from value destruction and moves towards value creation. So as a sort of overall summary, we're looking for businesses that are obviously creating value and growing and moving away from businesses that uh, 
might be destroying it. And, and on that point, just sort of the, the, the last part of your question, you know, what would make us sell? So we owned Rotalk for, for many years, which makes actuators. You know, we were analyzing, our, as I say, our model and looking at the returns profile. And there were some worrying signs that had appeared over recent times. Most importantly, that the incremental returns had been declining. Because you can have businesses that are making historically very high returns. But if you start seeing the incremental returns decline, that can be a really good early warning signal that all is not well. And, and in essence, our, our view, John, was that the actuator business had matured, margins and returns were declining. And the risk that the businesses were moving into an area maybe of perfect competition, and I'll, I'll come on and ex explain our thoughts on that in a sec because it's, it's quite important, was increasing. And therefore, we took the decision last December to, to sell out of, of the business. So if you think about, you know, what are we? We're quality value investors in that order. The quality part of, of the construct, the returns that the business was making, you know, were, were coming under pressure. And that's why, why we sold the, the business. And just coming back to that point I was talking about in terms of perfect competition. So we have a simple mental model that we think you know, roughly 90% of the market is in perfect competition. So what's the other part? The 10% is doing something different. It's either a monopoly, an oligopoly, or in a niche area. The reason that's why, why, why that's so important is because it means that these businesses are likely to be able to sustain the returns, the high returns that they've made in the past. They're more likely to, to sustain those into the future if they are doing something different. Again, you know, the, the well-known Warren Buffett quote of, of, of a moat, you know, something that's going to protect the, the business and the competitive advantage. We, we often look at this in terms of, uh, you know, this, the simple idea of a widget maker that's in perfect competition. It might innovate and make super normal profits in the short term, but its competitors are going to quickly come in and compete that excess return away. And what you as an investor want to avoid is overpaying, you know, for a business that's getting re-rated on, very sh on, on a sort of short-term increase in, in profitability when eventually competition comes in and competes that away because that's when you get a, a de-rating and a fall in the, in the share price of compounding the, the negative returns. Do you spend a lot of time studying the competitors of the companies you have in your portfolio? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's important to get a balance, actually, because, you know, again, and here's another sort of idea that, that, of, of a sort of mental construct. We, we live in a complex, dynamic um, system. You know, the economy is, is, is a complex, dynamic, adaptive system. So it's always changing. And I think when you're an investor, whether it's an Avon or Kroger or, or some of these other businesses w which we own, you have to obviously understand what they're doing. I and mean, we, we come and talk about Avon in, in a second, or we can talk about some of their, their competitors and what makes them different. So it's important to have an idea that the businesses in which we're investing do something that is maybe hopefully superior to, to the other businesses and that can help protect those returns. But critically as well, capital allocation within our companies is probably of a, of a higher order of importance. And that's because companies that make lots of uh, you know, high returns and, and generate lots of cash can sometimes have the challenge of, of, you know, where do they put that cash to, to, to greatest effect? And there can be an instance, instances where the, the capital is misallocated. So that's where we're, that's what we're trying to acknowledge. That's what we were analyzing when we were looking at Rotalk was, was capital being, you know, deployed in areas of lower profitability, et cetera. And that was bringing the investment case under, under pressure. Okay. So if um, we can jump into your portfolio, if we may, can you um, talk us through two stocks that you are very bullish on for the long term? And what was your thesis for investing? Of course. So maybe if we start with uh, Avon. So Avon, historically uh, named Avon Rubber, but uh, and as I'll explain in terms of what's happened with the business, you know, you can see the business has gone through an evolutionary change. It used to be, I mean, back in the day, so up to 1997, it made uh, rubber tires as well, but it came out of that business. But the two main parts historically over recent times have been the, the dairy business and the protection business. So the dairy business, based through some acquisitions, uh, acquired Milkrite and Interpulse. And effectively, they're using their technology and uh, the polymer technology to um, make farming systems, to make the, the, the farming process, you know, milking dairy herds much more efficient. But as I was mentioning earlier, as a sort of mid single digits, you know, uh, operating margin business. And I think the management just took the idea or, or came to the realization that there was greater growth and profitability by selling those assets off 
and reinvesting the proceeds into um, protection part of, of the business. They've just, just done that recently. And I mentioned the Team Wendy acquisition. They also bought the um, ballistics division of uh, 3M, so a well-known company for, for things like body armor. That's a really uh, interesting aspect and it's quite a big change to, to the business. So just coming back to the point we were talking about earlier, it's just important that we kind of analyze the effect that's having on, on the, the company. And they have had some challenges, actually. I was talking about good news stories. So on that obvious increase in profitability and the growth in a higher margin business, the market really came in and supported the business. And we, we've, we've owned this uh, company for several years now. You know, we bought it at under £10. And the shares, because of these good news stories, rallied right up to £45. Now, because they've had a couple of issues, one COVID-related, but you know, the, the other issues related to um, you know, testing and development that, that would lead to new products, the market was disappointed in, in the slow growth in the short term. So it, it sold off the companies aggressively down to, well, currently just down below £20. And the reason I mention that, because you know, we, we focus on owning businesses and not share prices, but I think that it's really instructive and it feeds back into what you were saying about when do you sell a business. It's easy to look back, John, in hindsight and say, we should have sold that business at £45. But actually, and here's the kind of, here's a critical point. As we sit here now with the shares, you know, less than half that value or ha- half that price, we don't think that was the wrong thing to do. And the, the critical reason is, because at £45, we still thought that was offering good, good value given the future prospects of the business. We obviously think that's increasingly the case just now. And we think these issues are short term in, in nature. And therefore, you know, we want to buy our favoured assets when they're more attractive in, in price and valuation. And in terms of, the, in terms of the, the protection business, as I say, they're basically using a, a manufacturing um, breathing apparatus, re- respiratory uh, systems. But with their recent acquisitions, they've got full protection. If you, th- if you think about um, military personnel going in, into very hazardous and dangerous uh, areas, and, and this is underwater as well. So they've got an MCM 100 mask, which is uh, called a rebreather, which creates no bubbles. So if you think about you know, entering into a covert operation on, underwater, you're not going to give your location away because bubbles are rising to the surface. So these things are all, all in development for this business. You know, if we look at the scope of things and, and what increases our confidence that what's happened in the past can continue, Avon paints a really interesting story here because um, four or five years ago, they had, had only one long-term contract which um, was contributing, and that was with the Department of Defense, and, and that was for the M- M50 uh, masks. If you kind of bring that up to date now, they've got over six long-term contracts. And what that does is a couple of things. It increases um, one's confidence that the current revenues and profitability can continue and and grow as they win new contracts. But what becomes very clear is they've got um, a a good competitive advantage against some of their their peers. MSA Safety is is a good example. It's a, a US business. And with their C50 um, masks, they effectively acknowledged, this is some years ago, that Avon had greater um, technological capability. So they actually went off and developed more uh, products in the fire uh, safety area. So that's kind of a good example of, you know, what can help sustain those returns uh, for the business. But those increase in long-term contracts is, is excellent because that shows that the, the competitive advantages, if you like, are, are increasing for, for the business. And they've got various other, you know, the MCM 100 contract um, that they were bidding for as well. I think it's, it's further evidence that they've got a technological, because what, what they're, they're up against, um, you know, another company who is very mechanical in the way in which they're developing that, that product, whereas this is a fully contained electronic e- equipment that Avon is developing. So when I spoke with the, the management recently, uh, they're quite confident that they should have, they should do well in that in that uh, contract and hopefully hopefully win it because of that greater technological advantage that they've got. And, and are you expecting to see an uptick back in operating margins and return on equity over the next few years? Yes, I mean that's that's obviously the part of the reason why we continue to support the the investment case. So you know often the figures can be quite take a time for for the figures to sort of flow through. 
when you have a big reorganization because they were selling off quite a lot of their their revenues in terms of the, the milk business, as I say, lower margin uh, revenues. We think they're going to continue to develop on, the, as I say, their the technological superiority and when they're bidding for, for contracts. As I, I mentioned three, you know, the, the Department of Defense, the Ministry of uh, Defense, NATO, they've also got Middle East and Australian clients as well. So they're really, they're expanding both the end client, which obviously reduces the investment risk. If you know, if you have, if you're a milk supplier, to, to use that analogy, to Tesco, Tesco got all the pricing power, haven't they? And as as Avon have uh, leading products and are supplying more and more um, different agencies, we think that further de-risks the you know the, the investment case for for the business. Yeah, it's a fascinating company. Okay, yeah. David, thanks for um, sharing that one. And how about your uh, second company you'd like to talk about? So Croda is one that we, um, if you looked at our fact sheet, you probably know that's uh, our largest position at the moment. And it's, it's, this is really interesting. Kind of talking about Peter Lynch, it came to my attention that, let's see, back when I started investing and was a, a sector analyst for the chemicals uh, division at Ignis on, on the UK desk, what, what we saw with uh, Croda was you know, very, still a very attractive you know, back then, a very attractive business model. And so I started investing in it. So I'm coming up to nearly 20 years having been a, a consistent investor in, in Croda. And obviously, the investment story evolves over time. In essence, the best way of thinking about, about Croda is its products coats, coat things. So um, everything from, you know, crop care and life sciences, consumer um, ingredients, they make active ingredients, uh, you know, for a whole whole range of consumer products, etc. The point I was going to make in terms of that time period over which uh, you know, I've been invested in, in Croda is it's gone up, I think, 32-fold since, since I owned it. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is to, to illustrate the point and reflect what Peter Lynch was talking about with, when he was talking about his, his 10 baggers and, and the fact it took several years to be invested. You, know, you need to own businesses of high enough quality that when the market is falling both in and out of love with the companies, like we were demonstrating with Avon, that you're happy to come in and support that and buy those at more attractive valuations. Because if you take, and, and, that, and that's, you know, sounds fine for Crude, it's a very, very strong return. It's about 20% annualized return um, over that time period. If you actually move back a year, that has a material impact. I think it's something like a 25 fold increase and then another year it's an 18 fold increase and and so the reason i'm highlighting that is because you can see as time marches on because obviously it's based off a a low entry point 20 years ago the subsequent returns that the business makes has a disproportionate effect on the overall return does that make sense john in terms of what you know what what i'm sort of talking about in terms of the, the holding period and the returns that you can make assuming the business can continue to re invest um, returns at high incremental rates of return. It does make sense. And I'd love that approach. I think what's difficult at the moment with these sort of businesses is just that if you were to buy now that entry valuation point, yes, how well, long you'd have to <laughs> hold on before, you know, you see those large gains. But I mean, but this that, is the interesting point, you know, 20 and, and of course it's, it's a long time to think back, but 20 years ago, you know, I was probably just going through the same mental process, you know, thinking, well, Crowder's, you know, buying crude at this at this uh, share price. Look where it's come from. And so, the best and the worst thing about investing is you have to start with a clean sheet of paper every day. And as I say, both with the decisions of, of Rotalk and when we're looking at Avon and how that business is changing, and also crude as well, because they made a very big a- acquisition in relation to the, the business. I mean, it's twelve and a half billion um, market cap in, in the FTSE one hundred, and it's and it's kind of grown into that o- over the over the decades, as I, I was talking about. But you know how that acquisition of, of Ibachem changes the shape of the company and what impacts that's going to have and whether it represents a good deployment of capital. Remember, we, that's one of the critical things we were talking about. In order for those historic returns to be continued into the future, we need management to be able to allocate capital well in, in, in that area. Where can listeners go to find more information about you and your fund? So uh, we've got a, a website, um, which actually we're in the process of, of redesigning uh, now. So can watch this space for an updated version of that. But if you just Google Castle Bay Investment Partners, we will come up on, on the search there. Uh, and on that, we have a quarterly investment letters. Obviously, we have a monthly fund fact sheet for, for our UK equity fund. 
But I would direct, given, and hopefully this has come across in, in, in our chat today, you know, because we're looking to the longer term, we would direct people to focus on the quarterly, quarterly investment letters. And in those letters, I, I basically set out and develop some of the investment principles and philosophies that we've been talking about and link them back in to any recent activity or any companies that, that, we're, currently, that we're currently owning. Fantastic. Okay, David, thanks so much for coming on to the show. It's been a pleasure to uh, listen to you. Thanks very much, John.